Joshua chapter 9, and I'm going to begin by reading verses 1 and 2. And it came to pass when all the kings who were on this side of the Jordan, in the hills and in the lowland, and all the coast of the great sea toward Lebanon, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite heard about it, that they gathered together to fight with Joshua and Israel with one accord. This message today I want to bring is entitled, The Three Deceptions of Satan. The Three Deceptions of Satan. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we just praise you and we thank you today, God. Lord, for all that you've done in this service. And that, Lord, the only thing we have to do is lift up a shout to you, God, and mountains will bow down. Seas begin to roar, God, just at the mention of your name. Look, Scripture teaches us that demons tremble at the name of Jesus Christ. So today, Father, the only thing we have to do is lift a voice up to you. And so, God, Lord, as I begin to expound on the Word of God this morning, I just pray, help me to bring it with unction and anointing and power from on high. Lord, my... When I first went into this message, I didn't see it this, this way, but this is how it's coming to me right now. And this is exposing the enemy's playbook. And even what we're seeing happen. So that's what we're doing today. We're calling him out so people can really see him for who he is. And so, Father, I pray, help me preach with this anointing and unction from Ohio. Bring back to my remembrance only that which you would have me to say today, God. And I ask all this in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. You may be seated. The three deceptions of Satan. Now, when I say this, let me begin this message by saying that I hope we realize there are more than three. There's way more than three. We're looking at three. So, since entering into the promised land, Joshua and the Israeli armies have only the victory so far of Jericho and I under their belt. And you would think, to me, that would be enough. Just Jericho. Man, we lift up a shout. Walls come tumbling down. But it is not as if there's some seasoned force that just at the mention of their name, it strikes fear into the enemy. See, they haven't built that type of reputation yet. See, the inhabitants of the land had long established and been there for a while, and, and treaties had been made between their chosen kindred. And though different in their ideology, when an opposing force began to enter their region, or their, what they considered their land, these divided nations would join together against what they would say would be their common foe. Hence the phrase, they came together in one accord. Now, after only two victories, the enemies of God felt threatened. So I believe if I were to poll everybody today, we would say that we have sensed there is a shift or a direction that's beginning to happen in this ministry and one in which God has long prepared us for. And much like our predecessors in this account, the adversary is going to become more threatened in the sense of any sort of victory or any sort of advancement that we either make individually or corporately as this church. So the lesson we could quickly learn from our adversary is simply this. When he is threatened, they unite it. You see, one of the greatest weapons that we have in our arsenal and that we have as a church in defeating the adversary is when we come together and offer up a singular praise or a singular shout to God. And what I mean by that is we come together in one mind, one accord, for a common goal, and that is to glorify our God. See, someone once said it this way, the art of deception lies in action, not in words. So, when an illusionist is performing some sort of trick. They either direct our attention away from the deception or there's a sudden movement. Y'all wait for a cord to a bird to come out, won't you? Something catches our attention while they're making the switch over here. You see, the action of the illusionist is directed towards our senses. Praying particularly on the eyes, which in turn affect our thoughts. 
So it becomes a manipulation, if you will, of the mind, causing it to react contrary to what it knows to be a foundational truth. So it reacts against itself, thus creating the greatest deception of all. In Joshua chapter 9, look with me in verses 4 and 5. It says that they worked craftily and went and pretended to be ambassadors. And they took old sacks on their donkeys, old wineskins torn and mended, old and patched sandals on their feet, and old garments on themselves, and all of the bread of their provisions was dry and moldy. So thus begins the first of three successive deceptions of the adversary, and the first being that of the outward appearance. You see, just as these leaders distinguished themselves to fool Joshua and the elders, this deception is repeated throughout Scripture. You see, in the account, you can find it in Genesis chapter 38, we find the account of Tamar when she deceived Judah. She was the widowed uh, daughter-in-law of Judah. And while Judah was on a journey, Tamar changed her garments, uh, took the garments of a widow off, and she veiled herself and dressed like the women of that time and of that city so that when Judah uh, would pass by, you know, he would not recognize her as his daughter-in-law. Now, only much later was the truth revealed. We know Jacob, through trickery, he tricked Isaac by wearing his brother's clothes, placing goat hair on his arms so that he would uh, feel at the touch like a, like a hairy man, cooked Isaac's favorite meal, thus deceiving the father and, and taking the blessing that should have went to the firstborn. You see, what happened is the deception is used time and time again, but we as a body fail to see it and recognize, and recognize it coming. Joshua 9.4 says they worked craftily in order to deceive. So this should immediately remind us the Garden of Eden, in which the serpent is said to be more crafty than any other creature. You see, it now becomes more than just a sleight of hand or more than just a misdirection of our thoughts. Because for it to be craftedly means that it was schemed. And a scheme is, is this plan that is a large-scale plan that uh, for attaining something but it's, it's very detailed and it takes time to make this plan and, but the whole thing is to either take something or to put something in place that would affect the change back into your favor so it was not thought up on a whim every single detail that these ambassadors have planned every detail in, in order to cover up and in order to steal I mean they just took their time the greatest deception which has already invaded the church deals with outward appearance. It looks good. It sounds even better. But it is simply a plan which Scripture says that even the elect of God can be deceived. And though it comes in many forms and at various times, this can most certainly appear immediately after major victories. Look with me in verse 7. It says, Then the men of Israel said to the Hivites, Perhaps you dwell among us, so how can we make a covenant with you? To me, that is the key statement in this entire chapter. Because this statement, when I say this, and, and hopefully I can paint a picture and show you why this, this is so key, but this statement should make us shudder at the effective, effectiveness of deception and, and how it can affect an entire body. Let me recall into your remembrance Deuteronomy 29 verse 5. Have I not led you for 40 years in the wilderness? Your clothes have not worn out on you and your sandals have not worn out on your feet. So now you've got the leaders of Israel. You have these Hiv, uh, the Hivite ambassadors coming with, with worn out clothes and worn out food and worn out wineskins and all this stuff that's just completely worn out. And so now you've got the elders of Israel looking at them saying, how do we know you ain't part of us? How do we know you didn't come up from a tribe? You know, we, we don't know everybody in every tribe. So how do, how do we know you didn't come, come out from among us and we cannot make a covenant with you? 
with just that appearance of loan, they should have been able to distinguish themselves apart from those ambassadors because they should have been able to look at themselves and say, you know what? God provided for me for the last 40 years and I've been running with these shoes for 40 years and it's the same shoes and they still look brand new. Look at the clothes that, are, that, that I'm wearing. They have not worn out. They're not rag, tag. Look, I busted up against a bunch of rocks trying to get my sheep over to this side and, and they're not torn, they're not ripped and they're not worn out. But here you are standing in front of me and I'm, and see, the deception is they begin to question, well, did you come out from among us? The outward appearance may have changed, but it didn't change what was underneath the garment. See, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 7, the first part says, Do you look at things according to the outward appearance? And when I say this, that is where many churches fall short. Because when they see people come through the door and they don't look like how the people on the inside look, then they don't want to have to do nothing with that person. See, there's a fine line here. We cannot judge on outward appearance alone. You see, not knowing who may or may not come through these doors on any given day, the worst thing we can do is to make assumptions based on outward appearances. You see, we are great about welcoming anyone in. And listen to me what I say very carefully. My prayer is, because I, 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 I kinda, I'm timid in this part of the message, because I don't want that to change about us. We, as a church, we've got a big heart, and we want to help everybody. But what we must guard against is the adversary also knows we have a big heart, and he'll try to use that against us. See, we want to see it. We're like Jesus. When I say this, we're like Jesus Christ in that we want everybody to get to heaven. We'll pray with everybody. We'll, we'll do whatever it takes to, to welcome them in, to make them feel a part of this ecclesia, and, and, and to bring them so they feel part of the body of Christ. But what we must be careful of is that the adversary doesn't send in a wolf in sheep's clothing. See, Scripture reminds us, or should remind us, test all things. Not just prophecies, not just dreams, but test people as well. Now, don't be concerned because there is no written test when this message is over. I don't know about you. I'm not good at taking tests. Well, I'm saying time bears out. You see, it is difficult to determine, to determine somebody's spiritual maturity based on outward appearance alone. I have run into some people that I'm telling you, I, I don't know why they're not filling up Dodger Stadium and preaching the Word of God. I mean, it flows out of their mouth like honey. But then when I really got to know them, I didn't want to have anything to do with them. And I didn't want my name associated with them. Because what I saw in private was not what they were portraying in public. Man, it's getting quiet in here. here here's how I heard a pastor say it. If you cannot pray in private, you cannot worship in private, you cannot, when I, and I'm going down just a list here, dance in private, you know, all these things in private, then how do you expect to do it in public? You see, it's the reverse. You see, I cannot come in here and offer up prayers to God if I'm not doing it at home in private. It's hard for me to come in here and clap if I'm not clapping in private. It's hard for me to, you know, all these things. Well, it's the same when we're talking about people and the outward appearance. Look. Whatever we are in private is what we re truly are in public. Now, we're good about hiding it. Remember, we're talking about inceptions. We're good about getting people to look over here while we're doing something else over here. We'll get to that in a minute. Matthew 23, 27. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside you're full of dead man's bones and all uncleanliness. You see, a person can have it all together on the outside and be just as spiritually dead on the inside as a grave. See, outwardly they look great. Outwardly they sound great. But inwardly, they're full of schemes, corruption, and deception. They're all the time trying to manipulate situations and people and different things so that it always comes out that either they're the martyr and the victim or they're either praised and it makes somebody else look like they're the ones that doesn't have it all together. 
while outwardly they got it all together, you would think they, they I mean, it's the picture perfect family. It looks like the Donna Reed show or something. But then when you really get them in private and really get to know them and the truth really begins to come out, the hypocrisy, the envy, the pride, lust, covetous, malice, all that just begins to surface and bubble to the top. Give it time. What's the first solution to this first deception? Job 5.13 tells us, He catches the wise in their own craftiness, and the counsel of the cunning comes quickly upon them. People can scheme, they can plot, they can devise, whether it's a church or whether it's the nation. They can do all of this. And while their hope is built on their plans, see, all their hope, all their joy, everything that they say that they can experience in life hinges on one thing, that their plan comes to pass. Oh, man, if it would just turn out like this right over here, then you know what? Then I'm in high cotton then. Man, if it would just, just turn out, well, well, let me see if I can get this in this person's ear over here so they'll go talk to this person, and then I can slip in this way. And man, if my plan just works out. Well, see, here's what we cannot forget. God sees the schemes. He sees the plans of the wicked just as well as He sees that of the righteous. He allows them to prosper for a season in which their confidence becomes built upon themselves, and then pride comes before the fall. Look, this nation, that look, there have, for decades have been scheming, there has been plots, and there has been plans. And what we're seeing now, all these things begin to bubble to the surface. But God has seen every scheme, every plan, every plot. And what they do not realize is, God is setting them up for their own demise. See, he reverses the plan against them. See, they're permitted to prosper for a while, and in that season of prosperity, God's trying to get them to come back to him. See, that's what happens in the church. Let's not just look at it broad as a nation. Let's come back to the church. You see, we may see people scheme, plant, plot, and all that stuff, and there's time and time and time again. God's calling. God's calling. He's trying to speak. He's trying to draw them back to the altar. He's trying to get them back in a relationship. Oh, you've lost your anointing. Oh, you've walked away from me. You don't realize it, but I'm trying to get you back. I'm trying, I, I do this in your life to draw you back. It may be a little bit longer. Then he does it. He's trying to get you back to himself. He does everything. But then there comes a time when he has to even back up and say, you know what, you won't listen to me either. You don't believe me? Go read the book of Revelation. It talks about the prophetess Jezebel who went in and God said, I, for a season, he allowed it. But then there come a season when that season was over with, he allowed her to fall. And it talks about all the things that he would do against her or permitted against her because of her uh, indiscretion, because of her, you know, her sin, everything that was going on in her life. So there are seasons in which it looks like, man, they're just getting ahead. Why do they keep getting ahead? And I think I'm doing everything that the Bible requires, everything God's asked of me. I've wore out 20 pairs of pants on my knees in the altar, you know, trying to pray and seek the face of God and just be in this deep relationship with God. I'm trying to love on God. The only way I know how is, look, there's times I'm praying. I, you know, God, I just don't know how to pray no more because I'm praying, 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 praying. And it looks like nothing's moving and nothing's happening. And, 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 and so we become discouraged. But look at this person over here. My Lord, if anything else works out for them, their head will be so big you'll never get them back into church. Why does it keep working? Because God, in a way, is they have plotted and schemed, and God is trying to bring them back. But there comes a time in everybody's life when you must fall. If we don't turn. In 1 Peter 3, 3 and 4, Do not let your adornment be merely outwardly arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. It, this isn't simply a solution against deception, but a warning for ourselves. You see, cannot get so hung up on the outside that we allow our spirit man to die on the inside. 
We can't get so hung up on on order of church services or or, or whatever it may be and get so hung up and put everything on that because that's the plan and that's how things are supposed to turn out when in essence we're sitting here dying on the inside. You see, in private, when I'm alone and by myself and there are no and there is no music and I don't have anybody else to, to pray with and I, can, can I still praise and worship? Can I still pray? Because it ain't about what's happening on the inside. It's about what's happening on the inside. I mean, on the outside, but it's rather what's happening on the inside. See, the most important part of our life is our soul and our spirit because that's what lives eternally. That's what's going to go and meet God. And what did he say the greatest of these things were? The beauty of a gentle, gentle spirit. Let me tell you what that is. That's the inward character of a person. Let me, I've heard it described this way. Let me tell you what inward character is. If you're the same person right here when nobody's looking around, nobody sees and nobody hears, you're the same person right here, or if you're standing in the middle of Walmart with 500,000 people walking around. Inward character is being that type of person when nobody, look, you can come to church and say, oh yeah, we help, we do this, we do that, okay. But then when you go out there and to walk by when you know the Spirit of God tell you you need to help that one, no, no, they don't look right. They don't smell right. And you keep walking. But the Spirit of God told you to help. You know, it's easy to help in here. It's harder to help out there. But we should be the same person in here or out there. You see, it's about character. And so God uses these times to build character. In 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, the last half of that verse, it says, For the Lord does not see as a man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Saul looked like the king of all kings. They said he was a handsome man. He was a tall man. You could see him above everybody else. There was no mistaking King Saul was coming. But Saul lost his anointing. Saul lost his relationship with God by seeking some of the things of this world rather than seeking God himself. You see, God sees what nobody else can see. That's the thoughts uh, and, and the intent of the heart. And he knows if the anointing is there or if the anointing has left. God sees it and God knows it. And I'm telling you, that is, when I say this, not just because I'm standing here, because it takes anointing to sit out there too. And it takes anointing to go to work. It takes anointing to, well, it takes anointing to drive the road with all these other nuts. It takes the anointing of God to, to stay in your car and keep your peace in private. It, that's character. Let me tell you, you can tell whether somebody has the anointing or they lost the anointing. And like I said earlier, God gives that season. He gives that time. Then He deals individually. Let me move on. Joshua 9, verse 8 and 9. But they said to Joshua, We are your servants. And Joshua said to them, Who are you and where did you come from? So they said to him, From a very far country your servants have come because of the name of the Lord your God. For we have heard of his fame and all that he did in Egypt. This not only stands as the second deception, but reinforces the first. Remember the statement? How do we know that you are from among us? Well, they heard the report of what God had done. They had not seen it for their own eyes or experienced it for themselves. They heard of the deliverance from Egypt. They heard of a Red Sea crossing. They heard how the Jordan was parted and the victories of Jericho and I. It was a superficial knowledge of what God done for His people. I got to pause. I know I'm dealing with this deception, but here's what we must not get hung up on because I, I do not think this is in this message, but it's coming to me right now real strong. The greatest, one of the greatest deceptions that we can to deceive ourselves is to trust in somebody else's experience. Let me explain. 
I know because, I mean, I've heard this. I, and I was there myself. So d- don't think I'm preaching to you, beating you up or anything else. I've been there myself, and it was something that I had to break. But I used to, I'm telling you, I used to see it. And y'all know, y'all know where I'm from. I always sit on the back row because I didn't want anybody behind me. I ain't trust nobody. Now I preach with my eyes closed. That's trust. Up in front of everybody. So here's, here's my point. Man, I get a blessing out of watching everybody else. You know, they're in the altar. And they're experiencing the glory of God. This one's in the altar. Man, that was good to, to, to see them get healed. That was good to see God pour His Spirit out on them. And I'm not saying God can't work. I mean, I, I get it. I, I really, truthfully, I do. But like Lester Summerall said, I don't need to go to every, every person there is on the face of the earth for personal prophecy. I can go to God myself and get my own word. Look, I don't want... Now, as great as it is to watch, say, Miss, Miss Karen worship God or, or Wayne and, and to see him come to the altar and all that... But you know what? I want to come to God myself. I don't want to try to try to live off of what I've seen or heard somebody else experience. I need to experience it myself. So the greatest deception that one that has hit the church is that we watch everybody else get blessed and wonder why we're not. It's about getting engaged. It's about going after God with everything that we have. See, that brings us to the preposition in that phrase in this text. The word of. It is the expression of the relationship between a part and the whole. See, there's many people they've heard of God, but very few really know God. We have heard of miracles that many have personally witnessed, but many doubt that God can do those same miracles today. So it transcends beyond the outward appearance to express what is truly on the inside. Though the outward appearance seems to be in place, the individual may be devoid of an inward relationship with God. They know of God, but they have no relationship with God or in God. See, like our deceivers of this text, they say they came because of the name of the Lord and of His fame and of His miracles. You see, once God really begins to pour His Spirit out upon all flesh, and once the power of God really begins to hit churches that's been seeking God, I'm telling you, it's like they've always said, you get a church and a people on fire, and people are going to come watch you burn. A lot of people are going to come simply out of curiosity. So the greatest deception of all is when someone says, the Lord sent me here, or I have heard of what God is doing for you at your church. Now granted, the Lord does build His house, and He said He would send people from afar off to build His house, according to Zechariah. I'm talking about those who come in for the very first time, and they want, and we, nobody knows them from Adam's house cat. And we're sitting here looking at them and saying, Oh, I've got to take the stage, give me the mic, and get out of my way. Many are going to come and see. But we must test. Joshua 9 verse 8. But he said to Joshua, we are your servants. And Joshua said to them, who are you and where did you come from? See, that is why it is so imperative to build relationships within the church in order that we might prove the validity of who is among us and who is not among us, but is just appearing to be like us. You see, even Joshua began to question well, when did y'all arrive and where did y'all come from? And I, I've never heard of that place. And, and, and who are you? At least somebody finally began to question. Scripture also indicates that if we that we are not to lay hold of someone too quick, so that we may test validity, we may question motives rather than appearance. Mark eight eighteen reads this way, and I just I love how it. It words this. Having eyes do you not see, and having ears do you not hear? Here's the third question he asked. And do you not remember? You see, that's part of the problem that's going on with these leaders, is we don't remember ever seeing y'all before. We don't we don't even remember what try you know, what where are you at, where you're talking about. We don't remember these things. See, that's why it's imperative from time to time that we together 
that we begin to recall what we know God has shared with us and with this church and about this church. And the mandate of God and when God moved and when He has spoken. You see, these men sought a covenant with Joshua, but remember God told them, you don't make a covenant with nobody else but me. You don't make a covenant with nobody else but me. What we must do as a body of believers and together as the church is we've got to keep God's directives before us at all times. That's why on the announcement screens, I keep putting up Brazil and I keep putting up Mozambique. I'm trying to keep it out before us at all times so that we don't forget and that we can keep praying. You know, I try to keep up different things that are going on to keep it out before us. See, we must develop a life that is in tune with God so that we know that together we can recall everything that is going on. I'll, get, I'll, I'll tie this back in a minute. In Matthew 13, 15, the first half, it says, For the hearts of these people have grown dull. Let me tell you what deception does. When deception comes... We know it distracts us. But in order to distract us, we must first be desensitized. They don't bring out the big golden trick right out of the gate. If you notice, they start off with a little card or a little coin. And then the tricks get bigger through the progression of their show. And that is because they take the little coin and the card and then the bird and then all that and then cutting a rope and putting it back together. They do all these things to begin to desensitize us so when the greatest trick of all appears, we're already used to it. We're not looking at the sleight of hand or looking for the sleight of hand. See, many believers are being deceived today because their spiritual eyes and ears are dead. They're not dull, they're dead. We, do, we no longer see to perceive or, or, or hear or have an ear to hear what the Spirit of God has to say. We cannot discern between what is truth and what is a deceptive word. Remember, in the garden, the serpent deceived Eve with just a slight deviation from truth. It was mainly truth, but there was just enough to say to make it a false statement. So that is what is happening in the body of Christ today. Many of people are following after people and, and, and churches and all these things and, and all this is going because of a, of a quote-unquote now word. And it has a lot of truth to it, a lot of validity to it. You can go and look a lot of the points of that up, but ultimately it always comes down to there's one little piece in there that makes it false. So by definition, the whole statement must be false. Scripture tells us, iron sharpens iron. Why do you think we meet today? Iron is sharpening iron, and it prevents us from growing dull. It keeps us sharp, it keeps us new, keeps us ready to go to work for God. Here's the solution, 2 Corinthians 4 and 2. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the Word of God deceitfully but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. How will we know if we are being deceived or walking in truth? Paul writes right there, truth will always manifest itself. It may not look like what you want. It may not be expected like you want or or. But if everything aligns itself with the Word of God, because God will never do anything contrary to His Word. So if it is truth, it will bear itself out, it will record, and it will align with the Word of God, the complete counsel of the Word of God, not Scripture roulette, and you pick a Scripture out and make it say what you want to. Truth will manifest itself. Jesus Christ said He is the way, the... There you go. So what is it? It is Christ manifesting Himself in the church and through us. So when to keep from being deceived and so that there are no questions as to character or what is going on, truth itself will eventually bear out and we'll get to see what's on the inside. What did, what did Paul write? Philippians 3 and 10. That I may know Him in the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His suffering being conformed to His death. Look. That I may know God. 
How do I get to know God? What does it mean? Or what's, what is he talking about? To know in a ver- great variety of, of applications and with many applications. You see, we begin to notice each victory that is one and it is not one in the same manner. Because if it was one in the same manner, we would only know one facet of God. But if, say we deal with the same situation over and over, but each time it keeps getting solved in the same way. It keeps, or a different way, in a different way. Then we get each time we get to know something different about God. What if we're sitting here and we're dealing with troubles and we got all these troubles and situations and, and all these varieties of tests that is going on and God begins to answer them in different ways. Then we get to know Him in each and every aspect that that, that this situation requires of him. We get to know not just a name of God, but we get to know the character and the nature of our Father. You see, He's just not our God. He is our Father. We are His children. And so with all of this going on, it is God's way in, to get us to know intimately more about Him. Every trial that tests us does not come the same way. When God speaks, He speaks in different ways. If He spoke the same way every time and did the same thing every time, we would quit seeking after Him. God speaks in different ways. So we're always on our, man, we, is this it? We're on our tiptoes. We're, we're look, we, it's not that we're just looking and searching. I, I just want to be in tune. I want to be sensitive to His voice. I want to know that it's my God. I, well, how do I know? I'm going to test it against His Word because God is getting ready to bear His Word out. You don't believe me? Come on Wednesday night the book of Revelation. God's bearing His tr- Word out. Truth is happening and taking place right before our eyes. The variance is a means in which we discover who our God is, the vastness of our God. What else do we get to know? We get to know to trust God. Isaiah 50 and 10 says, Who among you fears the Lord? Who obeys the voice of His servant? Who walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely upon His God. It is not simply trusting God in every circumstance and situation. He's our Father. Let's go there. If, and this is, this, I'm trying my best to explain this. If Caitlin were here today, and, and, and this is different for everybody, and, and you could, with me not in here, Katie, what do you know about your dad? Or describe to us your father. You know, well, let me tell you, hard worker, provider, you know, He's got uh, black hair, hazel eyes. You know, those are, well, it was black. You turned it white. (laughs) But she could describe, what is that? That's outward appearance. And those are like surface, say surface areas about who I am. If you were to bring her in here and interview her privately, what I'm hoping and I pray that she would be able to tell you is, all right, let me do it this way. You caught me in that one. I, I get you this time. He has salt and pepper hair. More salt than pepper. It's getting saltier the older I get. It, you know, he's about this tall, hard worker, good provider. All right? Well, that's the outward. But then this is what I'm hoping she'll say. That I know he loves my mama. And will let nothing happen to me and my mom. That he loves me. Because when I was in marching band, all them cold, wet winter days during marching season, he never missed a band competition. When I needed to get to practice, he made sure I was there on time. You know, we, we, I could keep out on, hopefully I could keep out on going. You see, she's only able to give that perception of who I am because she has a closer, more intimate knowledge of who I am than you do. You see the salt and pepper hair, the height, whatever. Y'all know I love God. But hopefully she could tell you, you know, I've seen him in the living room and I know he's been praying for us and I know he's been praying for the church. I walked up on him reading the Word of God. You know, it's one thing to 
for me to come here and tell you I read that every day is something else when she says, I've seen him read it. So what happens is she has his deep, intimate knowledge of who I am because she sees the inner character in private that nobody else sees. So the point translates into this. It's not about the outward, it's about the inward. It's about our Father. And the only way, now we can say, now look, we can sit here today. Oh, He's our provider. He's El Shaddai. He's the Almighty. He's the I Am. And we can go right here, and and a good Christian, we can write off about 10 or 20 names of God just like that. And just keep right on moving. But, when you sit here and you can say, Man, I had this going on in my life. My God made a way where there was no way. He provided my finances. There was a time when I was sick and in the hospital and this happened. And he come, yeah, he's God my healer. But let me tell you what I felt laying in that hospital bed. And I began, you see what happens through these times and these t- We begin not just to grow and mature, but we get an intimate knowledge of who our Father is. So it's not about just knowing the names of God. It's knowing the nature of our God. So then we don't walk up to people, well, I heard of, uh-uh. I didn't hear of it. Let me tell you about my God. I'm walking with my God. I'm in the Lord. You know, we use more personal pronouns rather than the vagueness of, of a general oversight of knowledge. This is how we begin to really truthfully understand what is intimacy with God. Getting to know his nature and his character in private. Joshua 9, 12, and 13. This bread of ours we took hot for our provision from our houses on the day we departed to come to you. But now look, it is dry and moldy. And these wineskins, which uh, we feel were new, and see, they are torn. And these are garments, and our sandals have become old because of this very long journey. Now when these supposedly weary travels arrived, their clothes were completely worn they were worn slam out. They had walked the new off their shoes. The ability to claim to have a knowledge of God to avoid a relationship shows a lack of conviction on their part. Now let's add insult to injury with the third deception. That third deception is the moldy bread and the dried, worn out wine skin. You see, their claim is that when they had left their home, the bread was fresh and it was hot. But because they had traveled so far that the bread not only cooled, that bread molded. See, the application we can quickly make, and I think everybody here has probably already made it, that the bread could represent the Word of God. While the wine and the wineskins could allude to believers and to the Spirit of God. So the deception is to claim to have a now word, when in essence the individual is only recycling a word that they heard from someone else that they do not know, or in a source in which it's supposedly uh, uh, that it was derived from. So these alleged sources almost never give any glory or any credit to God. And while the now word is more inclined to know of God or the plans of God. So many today have placed their hopes, their dreams, their futures on moldy, stale bread. Look at verse 14. The men took some of their provisions. The land that they just crossed over in has always been described as a land flowing with milk and honey. It was harvest time when they crossed over. So the crops were at their fullest. Remember God says, I'm going to give you wells you have not dug, fields you have not planted, and houses you have not built. So now here they are walking in at harvest time, all this crop around them, all this food, fresh food, food they've never eaten before. They hadn't eaten in at least 40 years. And we could quickly attest to the fact that they uh, could never be so deceived with such trickery. But here these men willingly reached out their hands and received this moldy bread for themselves. Why would you reach out and take something that God did not give you? Joshua 9, 14 reads this way. Then the men of Israel took some of their provisions, 
but they did not ask counsel of the Lord. You see, once again, we see the folly of his men. What, you know, we could talk about the deception, and, and, but what's the, one of the biggest mistakes? They never asked God. They never went and sought, God, is this of you or not? Do you want us to go this way or not? Do you want us to take this bread or not? See, that is the common mistake that every single one of us make possibly on a daily basis is when we're presented with any kind of circumstance, situation, we don't seek God first. You see, most of the time out of ignorance, but occasionally out of our zeal for God, we won't seek the advice of God or wait and allow God to work it out. You see, we view things as opportunities, as if, they, as if every opportunity comes from God, when we should seek His direction first and say, God, is this of you or not? Should I even get involved in this or not? 1 Timothy 4.1 says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and to doctrines of demons. A deceiving spirit is a false teacher who, uh, who can very easily deceive people and is widely accepted by all. You know, it's just like sugar off the tongue and everybody want, you know, wants what they have. You know, you've heard the term, you know, about drinking the Kool-Aid. Well, let's all just drink the Kool-Aid. But false teachers would arrive and people would just give over to these itching ears. It says doctrines of demons. And that are the teachings that is propagated through the false teachers. These false words, this old stale moldy bread. Teachings that are full of lies and full of deceptions. And even in the Word of God says it in these latter times that not only would the elect be deceived, but many people would give themselves over to itching ears. There are still people, believe it or not, that want to hear truth. 2 Timothy 3, 5 says, Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And from such people turn away. You see, we can see how this deception is a lie built on top of a lie, built on top of another lie. They appear to have it all together. They look great on the outside. They have all this, this million dollar millions of dollars of buildings and, and all this stuff that's happening. Thousands of people come into attendance every time just to hear them speak. But they deny the resurrection power of God. They deny the Spirit of God. They deny the role that the Holy Spirit plays in the life of believers. Let me bring back to our remembrance, or do you not remember? The times we've been in here in an urgent prayer and we come in and begin to pray for people and all of a sudden we get a report a day or two later they not only were healed they got up and walked out of the hospital. Let Hold on. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. That was as weak as water. <laughs> look, there's a lot of things I could say a lot of questions I could ask a lot of things. But look, God has put a remembrance stone in front of us every time we come in these doors, and it's in the shape and the form of Evelyn Osfield. We praise our God for that. We can look over and see how God's working in the lives of other people. And, 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 and look, oh my God, I, I could just go on forever right now. How God gave us as opportunities a church to get into the lives through Paul and Faye. Uh, we you know, made that connection years ago with them, known them for years. And through them, we ended up with Sarah and Zaria. And I mean, my God, look at how those girls are advancing and how they're growing and, 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 and how their lives are beginning to change. I praise God for that. And I praise God for that opportunity. I mean, let's come in here. Let, let's give God glory, guys. It's time we remember and hold these things back to the forefront again. And never forget, our God. look, people can deny the power, the resurrection power of our God. They can deny the Spirit of God all they want. But they'll never convince me. And let me tell you why. I have experienced it for myself. I have experienced His touch. I've experienced it when the finger of God lifted in a situation that I was dealing with. And I saw my Father work it out for His glory. For my best but for His glory. I don't know about you, but how many in here today you can attest right now unequivocally, I have felt His touch. I have felt His presence. Then give Him glory this morning. Don't sit there and be quiet. Don't allow the enemy to deceive you.
They have an outward form of religion, but deny its power and its influence. Let's keep going. Luke 4 and 4. But Jesus answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. See, these strangers didn't realize that, just like the Scripture says, Man, we don't live by bread alone. I live by this right here. I walk by this right here. I try to guide my life by His Word. You Look, you could try to force feed me moldy bread all you want. But when I get into this, I come face to face with the living God. I come face to face with a Word that has changed me into who I am today and not who I was. You see, that deception is the adversary tries to remind you of who you used to be, how you used to walk, and how you used to talk. But what begins to happen is the living God gets inside of you. And when it gets inside of you, you can't, you're no longer who you are, who you were. You are who you are in Jesus Christ. Let me go ahead and tell you what the Word says. It says that Scripture will never refute itself. God will never con- contradict His Word. And it is difficult. <laughs> this is the part I like. It's difficult to get bread down without something to drink. You see, 1 John 2, 27 says, But the anointing which you have received from Him abides in you, and you do not need anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in Him. They showed up that day. I, I, part of me would love to have been there. I pray, and I pray I would not have been part of the deceived. I pray that, that in me, something would have stirred and come up to where I could not have been quiet and I could have told him, put your moldy bread back in your sack, take your old busted wine skin, and go back where you came from. Now I know y'all think that, well, Paul, that's kind of bold. But they showed up with some old moldy bread and busted up wine skin, something they ripped a hole in and tried to sew it up to make it look like they come on a long journey. See, not only was their word dead, but their anointing, there was no anointing with the Word. So how can we know if deceivers are among us? Paul says that the same Spirit of God abides in every single one of us. And it's through that same Spirit, and it's through that same anointing that aligns us with one another because we have the same Spirit in common. You see, have you ever, let me ask you this, have you ever stepped in the presence of somebody? And they come to you, man, the biggest grin. But most of them, when they come in that big old grin, that's a car salesman. You need to run. And they're trying to sell you something. I mean, that's how I feel. Let's be honest. And you're getting there, and the whole time that they're talking to you, what are you doing? You're going, yeah, yeah, yeah man, that's right. You know, you're, going, you, you're giving it. It's outward. On the inside, something ain't right with this cat. On the inside, you're sitting here thinking, man, God. Please send somebody right here to get in end on this conversation so that I can slip out of this conversation and let them deal with this person. I mean, but look, be honest. I'm just being honest. Y'all just being holy. We've all been there. But you get that down in your knower. Something ain't right. Something in them is not aligning with what I know is in me. And so I'm not going to receive the word that is coming out of their mouth. You're not going to waste my time, my, my effort. Look, time is too short. There's too many people to reach. And when I feel it in my door, I'm going to ease right on out. Look, look, have you ever walked down the street? Steph and I just did this recently. And you want to talk about somebody <laughs> that's got a sensitive spirit? You'll have to ask us sometime. I'll tell you what happened in front of us. We were in Philadelphia. We turned this corner. And we look up a, a block up, up the street. Three guys standing there. Steph said, she kind of did this number. Wham! And we're in, the building had a little alcove there, you know, the post and all that. I mean, you had to see those buildings. We're in that alcove. What are we doing? We're just like this. We're going. They're still there. All three of them, it's escalating. We do that now. We got to cross the street. We got to go on the other side of the street, walk way out around the down, just, and we couldn't do that. So we had to walk by them, but we were walking like this, looking. But when we got there, man, she caught another gear. And I was huffing and puffing something wicked trying to keep up. But have you ever been in one of them situations on the street when you see something happening, you just know we got to get away from that. 
something bad is getting ready to happen right here, and I'm not going to be a witness. I'm not going to witness this thing. I, I, I'm out. What is that? It ain't just a gut feeling. That's the Spirit of God speaking to you, letting you know there's danger ahead, and you need to take a step. There's something that may bring you harm or a situation, and you need to get, you need to get, you got to go. You got to get out of it. Well, the same spirit and that same anointing will speak to you and let you know about your God, whether this is of God or not. That same spirit will speak to you and let you know, this is a facet of your God. This is what I'm trying to do in your midst. The biggest mistake that they made was not checking with God. That's the biggest thing they made. Let me close with this. Because this is, this is just where my mind, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to wrap this together. Joshua 9, 23 reads, Now therefore, you are cursed, and none of you shall be freed from being slaves, woodcutters and water carriers for the house of my God. Now, when you conclude reading Joshua chapter 9, it appears to be this marvelous ending. I mean, read it once sometime. It just, it just appears great. Here's these men, this nation. They have been deceived by the enemy. They, they've been duped. They go in, and they see those same men standing in their cities in their now adornment. And they realize, man, we've been tricked. But see, here's how we'll try to super spiritualize things. Oh, but look at their character. You see, they chose to express grace and mercy to these men because they had made a covenant with them. And they had decided, though being deceived, we will be men of our word and we'll keep the terms of the covenant. But there had to be some sort of consequences for your deception. You deceived us. Now we've got to get you back. See, it was purposed that the deceivers would become their slaves and cut the wood and gather the water for the temple services toward God. And though what I've taught previously are and have been proving out over time to be great deceptions, suppose with me for a moment that these are not the greatest deceptions of all time. Let's suppose this morning that the greatest deception is not being deceived. Let me tell you what the greatest deception is. The greatest deception is believing that someone else can perform what God called you to do. He never asked for any heathen nation to defile his house for his articles and for a heathen nation to cut the wood or to draw the water for the tabernacle service. Think of the discretion and the hypocrisy of a non-believer and that here a non-Jew performing services of honor and glory to God. Think about how that desecrated the name of God. But unfortunately this deception has eroded the effectiveness of the church for some time now. Because you see, we'll pay others to be the missionaries and to do things that we're not willing to do ourselves. We view many tasks as being men, minimal, menial, or beneath who we are. I've been saved this long and I'm at this maturity level, so, so this is beneath me. This is for something for someone else to do. Others act as if they're too good to get involved if they think that task is beneath them. They're more concerned with how this world views them rather than the God who sees the inside. There is no task so small that the people of God should not be involved in. Now, I know many of you may know, some of you, you don't know me. I didn't get saved and make it here 
and go immediately to here. I didn't start preaching full time until I was about 41 and a half, 42 years old. But the first initial call happened when I was 13. Now, granted, Paul Lancaster messed up for about 20 years. I hold that. I don't hold it proud, but I, I own it. I messed up. And then from 35 to 42, I have ushered. I have crawled under churches to fix whatever needed to be fixed, even if it won't plumb. I've crawled in attics. If you've ever been in an attic in North Carolina in August, you don't want to be there. That's like the step before just stepping into hell. And I have always held to the attitude, and I still hold to it today, just like the psalmist. If I am no more than a doorkeeper in the house of my God, as long as I'm serving my God with everything that's in me, that's all I want to do. That's it. You know something God did in this church when we first went on? Uh, this was that. I don't know, just something's always been, been on me. To reach the people that nobody else wants to reach. To go after people nobody else wants to talk to or, or spend time with. And I believe that's the mandate. And I believe, and when I say this, this is not, this is not a rebuke. This is not, look, we've been great about that. But y'all know me, we can always get better. And if other churches and other people don't want to take time with them, hey, that's us. Father of lies and deceptions is working overtime. And these are final days. Now we can choose to ignore these deceptions. And if so, there's a great possibility we'll be overcome by them. Or we can become proactive in what God is trying to accomplish through a people who will be wholly dedicated to Him and seek Him first and foremost above all things. Everybody, please stand. Everybody.